Hello, and welcome to the Scurf Interviews podcast. I'm your co-host for the day, Eugene Leventhal, and today's topic that we're going to be getting into with our other co-hosts and our esteemed guests will be protecting the heart asset, making a DAO and its treasury robust against attack. So to kick us off, Kelsey, who's our other co-host for today, Kelsey Nabin from RMIT, do you mind just jumping in and giving a quick intro? Sure. Thank you, Eugene, and thanks for having us. So my name is Kelsey Nabin. I'm a researcher at the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub, and I'm really excited for this conversation. So my research is on uh, resilience in decentralized technology, including DAOs, but I'm looking forward to hearing what my colleague academic and uh, what the industry practitioner Daniel has to say today. Daniel, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for having me. This is, um, I'm very excited about this conversation. So for, from my side, I'm a, I'm a DAO practitioner. I specialize in governance and organization design. I come from a background uh, studying and consulting and essentially working and, and figuring out what networking or organ networked organizations are and how they could operate. And then I guess it was only a matter of time before encountering blockchain and, and realizing that this is the space where we have both the funds, the technological capabilities and, and a desire to, to innovate and do things different and became fascinated about this space. My, my most recent engagement was with Aragon to helping them facilitating the process of designing and launching the Aragon Network DAO. Uh, and now I'm in the process of speaking uh, with different organizations and so on, and perhaps launching a, a DAO to Link Studio uh, as a next step. So thank you for having me. Great. Thank you, Daniel. And Darcy, do you mind jumping in? Fantastic. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. My name's Darcy Allen. I am an academic economist, a senior research fellow at the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub. Um, I started my academic career as an innovation economist um, five or six years ago, working on the institutions and the governance of innovation, and then uh, came across blockchain and crypto, um, got completely obsessed with it. And now we have a research center that focuses on blockchain technology from a social science perspective. Um, and I try and take the tools of economics, of political science, of political economy, um, and apply them to the sort of cutting edge problems that are facing the industry today. Um, so I hope what I tell you I'm working on today, I'm working on something very different in three months, whatever the big issues are at that time. So we try and stay um, super relevant and uh, and I guess pivot to whatever whatever problems are facing and see what we can we can add as academics. So it's great to be here and I look forward to the discussion. No, we really appreciate all of you joining. And before we delve into sort of the depth of uh, how to make DAOs robust against attacks, I wanted to start with the question of what problem Treasury governance is trying to solve in the first place to really set the stage for the rest of the conversation. So uh, yeah, Darcy or Daniel, do you mind jumping in on that one? I'll, I'll jump in on this one. I think there's multiple problems. And I think this is a little bit misunderstood. We can we can get very focused on one particular problem that we're facing at that time in treasury governance, whatever it is, whether it's diversification or maybe there was a hack or whatever it happens to be. But if if I guess we zoom out a little bit, I think there's there's two main problems that treasuries face. Um, the first one is what an economist would call a knowledge problem. And that's the problem that any decision we make about a treasury happens under uncertainty. We don't know what we should spend a treasury on. Should we spend it on uh, ecosystem incentives or should we be spending it on research? That's, that's a knowledge problem. We don't know how to solve that. And on the other hand, there's sort of an incentive problem or a, an opportunism problem. How do we know that the, the treasury is being spent well? however that's defined. And I think we'll we'll dig into this a little bit, but that's the problem that all of the stakeholders within a blockchain ecosystem, as broad as they are, have to have some trust that the treasury isn't being misappropriated for various purposes, that um, there aren't people seeking too many rents out of it or that it's vulnerable to attack. Um, so there's sort of these two problems. There's a, there's a knowledge problem. What, what do we do under uncertainty? And there's an incentive problem and an opportunism problem. 
How do we make sure it's safe and secure? And any governance structures we try and put into a treasury um, have to deal with those problems and sometimes they're conflicting. So I think it's, it's really difficult to, to work through those challenges. That resonates a lot and thank you for, thank you for saying that. Um, for me, there is also perhaps something I, I would add, like uh, building on top of it and, and it very much relates to the knowledge problem that you're talking about, but it's uh, perhaps a very unique characteristic of, of DAOs compared to, to other treasuries is that because there is so little central control and we have so so few tools for sense making and decision making uh, collectively and and sometimes not even an intention to to have that so there is the whole range of DAOs being anywhere between a company and a public good and and so on so even the the like it's not only that in a company you can be, well, if we're increasing value for shareholders, that's a good decision. So at least the parameters to know what good decisions are or bad decisions are, are more or less clear in the traditional world. And in DAOs that all of those pieces are, are thrown up in the air again and, and is yet to see and every organization kind of needs to negotiate that again from zero, which ends up being deep philosophical questions. So. There is also kind of like, the, uh, let's say, combined with that, an, an infrastructure problem, a tooling problem of how can we address these other problems? Uh, but that's it's more to say that it's a, it's a brutal space with a, with a lot of challenges, a lot of uncertainty, trying to deal with large groups of people, semi-anonymous, sometimes permissionless and, 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 and so on. And, and that, that makes that these, uh, well, these knowledge problem, these incentive problem are particularly tricky to address. I, I think that's exactly right. And I think it's um, I think it's hard in part because we don't really know what blockchains are. So they sometimes they kind of look like firms, right? They're trying to um, achieve a particular objective. We're trying to do it all together. Um, sometimes they look like markets. There's a little, there can be payments within them and so on. And sometimes they look like governments, right? We talk about these treasuries sometimes as if it's a public purse or a treasury and reconciling those objectives can be really, really hard. We don't, we don't even necessarily know what the objective or the problem is that we're solving. And that problem changes as a blockchain, um, as a blockchain ecosystem grows. So the problem on day one, when you're deciding to structure your DAO and get your very first um, distribution of tokens is very different to when you've got a multi-billion dollar market cap um, and now you have so many more stakeholders, you've got VCs who want particular things, you've got people buying governance tokens on a secondary market and coming in and voting for things. Um, so just to add to your point, I completely agree. And I think um, we're still in the stage where we're trying to find out what this weird, weird new technology is. Um, and the tools, as you say, are super important in, in working this out. So I'm really interested to ground this in some practice and I'm looking forward to kind of jumping between the theory and the practical applications. But what are some of the threats to DAOs? And I guess the way that I'm thinking about this question is uh, blockchains and, and DAOs as both kind of socio-technical organizations. So you guys have each touched on some social threats and some technical threats in your broad kind of definition of governance. Um, of treasuries here, uh, and as well as uh, those kind of threats, uh, how can they either be negative or positive? So how can they provide the opportunity for, you know, adaptability and improvement? And maybe Daniel, it'd be interesting to hear from you to start with in terms of, you know, when you engaged with Aragon, what were some of the things you were thinking to design for or against? Thank you. So in, in this uh, in this instance, and I think uh, Aragon was uh, a peculiar case in the sense that they had been previously more decentralized, then they re-centralized, and this was another attempt at decentralizing in a more effective way. Like historically, what had happened, and they had um, more of a let's say a network of DAOs or a network of organizations rather than uh, a direct to contributor DAO. Uh, the terminology is perhaps a little bit fuzzy, but essentially they, they were giving grants to these other multiple centralized organizations that were developing different things for the Aragon network. And, and in these, uh, and that 
had some issues for a wide range of reasons, uh, some of which I just don't know because he was back in the day. But in this occasion, what we, what the division I, I was putting forward was more of a DAO where contributors could directly add value. And, and then over time, evolving to having multiple teams. So a sort of like teams of teams set up very liquid with fairly decentralized governance. And, and so thinking on that setup, the, some of the challenges are, and, and also Aragon being an organization that's been around for a while, there is a, a lot of the treasuries out there in the wild. There is some early stage wealthy investors. There were the founders who were like not really involved and they had significant tokens. So essentially we had huge disproportionate holding of tokens. So there would be a few people who could swing votes and almost like uh, make the network follow their will to some degree. And, and it was important to find ways to balance that out with a newer engaged community who had relatively limited token holding. So, so essentially, it was kind of like designing for an organization where you need to empower people who have to make decisions, who have very small amount of tokens, while at the same time being mindful that uh, maybe someone gets a huge fund. And I had some anonymous people reach out to me and say, like, hey, I want to buy one million tokens under, under the counter. Is there someone I can speak with this in private? And I'm like, uh, yeah, no, thank you. But, uh, but that was happening. And, and I, like that, that's the sort of environment that we're in. So, so that was kind of like one of the key design criteria is like, can we offer safety while having very low thresholds? And then the, the other sort of design principle was this is going to start very MVP, like very rough. Uh, we just want to get it out extremely quickly. And that was just a requirement that was uh, put on me by the Aragon leadership. He was like, we want to have a DAO in three months. And I'm like, that's kind of nuts, but OK, let's try. And, and it kind of worked, but obviously you made trade-offs at that point. And, and so the idea is, it's what I'm, I'm calling the, the sandbox approach as opposed to training wheels. So instead of kind of like simulating the situation by keeping a lot of control, it's more like get it out, even if it's not perfect, and let the community to start, to start iterating with it, which also meant kind of like all the thresholds and all the systems. So we needed to be able to, to change the governance process itself uh, it should be very easy to iterate it. And, and then that obviously brings all the other issues of like, well, there is a large community out there who has no clue what we're, what we're doing here. They've been disengaged for a long time and so, and so on. Uh, so kind of coming with Darcy, like uh, very strong issues around these, uh, this knowledge problem and also a very peculiar situation where Aragon um, towards that time, and the last time I checked, it was valued at about 150 million market cap. But the treasury, the value of the treasury exceeded the 300 million. So, so there was like there could be like some controversial situation there, where maybe some of the community didn't believe in the project anymore, or generally the market was undervaluing the project like extremely. Uh, and so that could kind of create incentives for people to try to withdraw the funds from the project. While the project lies in this strange limbo of trying to be a corporate or a company in many ways, a culture of company execution style uh, and those sort of objectives. And then on the other side, a very big mission like pro-social mission that is trying to achieve. So in the past, like in the, in the previous time they tried to decentralize, the issue was that people were asking for funds of like, yeah, we want to go and do exploration in Mars. And maybe that could be argued that it serves the mission because the mission is very broad and big, but it was clearly like completely left field and really not what anyone initially had intended. Uh, so it was trying to find ways to, to figure that out. Yeah, that's interesting. So you're sort of talking more about actually this the social dynamics of governance as both an opportunity and a threat in DAOs and to DAO treasuries. Darcy, what are your perspectives on the threats to DAO treasuries? Again, and I said this with the first question, I think it's it's really easy to focus too much on the, the given threat that you have at this time. Um, and what we like to do uh, is we like to take frameworks that we have elsewhere and apply them to new areas. And one of the frameworks that some of my colleagues and I have talked about is in a field called new comparative economics. And the basis of this field is when you think about problems that you're facing, 
in an economic sense, you can think about different governance structures as minimizing two types of costs. On the one hand, we have in treasuries, we have insider costs. We have the costs of um, the founders of a multi-sig or the, um, the board members of a foundation who might somehow misappropriate the treasury, send it to their friends, uh, run away with it, um, and so on and so forth. They're the sort of insider threats that come when you uh, create positions of privilege over the treasury itself, right? When you have a multi-sig or you have a foundation that's controlling the treasury. Now, on the other hand, though, you've got outsider costs. Those are the costs that outsiders might come in and buy governance tokens, for instance, and stack some vote. They might um, undertake some sort of civil attack to uh, use the voting system to their advantage and siphon off some of the treasury. Um, and whenever we're thinking about the way that we govern a treasury, you've got to trade off between either insider costs or outsider costs. And every different governance institution that you put in um, moves you in one of those directions. So if you have a uh, treasury that's controlled just by an individual, not even a multi-sig, it's all insider costs. You're worried that they're gonna run away with the treasury or do whatever they like with it. If you move from there to a multi-sig or to a foundation or to an elected foundation, you're moving away from the threat that those specific individuals will attack the treasury, but you're raising the costs that outsiders might come in in some way and try and um, take the treasury for themselves. So there's there's sort of this, this basic trade-off, right? Now, when, when we think about this, it's important to understand that, as I said before, those costs change over the life of a blockchain ecosystem. In the very early stages, you might face um, a really big threat from outsiders coming in and stacking a vote when you've got very little, uh, there's just a very low voter turnout. For instance, there might not be that many tokens in circulation. In that circumstance, it might make sense to actually have it held with the founders in a multi-sig. But as you move along, you might decide to decentralize your governance of a treasury um, because there's more stakeholders, because the sort of optimum governance structure is actually more decentralized. And the way that all of these tools that Daniel was mentioning fit in is that blockchains enable us to create new tools to minimize these costs in different ways. So we obviously get new types of voting like quadratic voting. Right? That's an attempt effectively to reduce the outsider costs of um, large token holders coming in and affecting the vote, right? And we, we're creating these new governance structures to minimize those costs in different ways. Yeah, that's so interesting that you mention it because then you have trade-offs though because obviously like the Sybil attack, you know, issue becomes a, a, a real kind of possibility in terms of the threat vector because people are incentivized to create multiple fake identities. So I like that way of framing it as this constant sort of thing around trade-offs to solve knowledge and incentive problems. Yeah, there's this, there's this constant trade-off and these both of these costs are unavoidable. In, in any governance structure you implement in a treasury, you're going to face some insider costs and some outsider costs. And the question is, where do you want to place yourself? Do you want to place yourself in... Um, you know, everything goes out to a DAO vote and it's automatically executed and we see what happens. Lots of disorder costs. Or do you just want the founder to have their own, um, to control the treasury completely? Now, what what's interesting and particularly about what Daniel was saying was um, we also discover what those costs are over time, right? We, um, for instance, in SushiSwap, you know, oh, wait, we didn't realize that there was a threat that... Um, Chef Nomi would run away with the treasury, right? Then it happened and we went, oh, wait, maybe we're not in, in the right spot here. Maybe we should decentralize this to a multi-sig or whatever. But the point is you figure these out over time. And, and as Daniel was saying, the way that you figure them out is you 
you effectively ship that DAO and you see what happens um, when it's out there or whatever the governance structure is. Um, and there's strats to that too, but you learn. <laughs> I quite I quite like the the framework of having these this polarity that I, I could al almost like say like well cost of say or risk of centralization versus risk of decentralization uh, to bring it right uh, to DAO terminology and and then on the I would maybe add the or as I was saying it occurred to me that the uh, not the other sort of um, polarity is between the safety and the risk taking so between the let's empower the community especially if we we think about about DAOs we want to make it as easy as possible for the community to be able to participate and contribute and and one issue like separated from well you know adjacent issue to to the whole treasury risk management conversation is the the voter participation or voter apathy and so and so on but just just to point that that's an issue and if if we add a lot of safety then that's the that's the trade off as well um so we need we kind of need to figure out in as, then in between these things, how much is safe enough and, and what are we having to do to make it safer? Like if we add a lot of mechanisms, a lot of delays, higher thresholds, whatever it is in, in wh whether it's more uh, inside, uh, protecting against insider cost or about outsider cost, uh, then we'll also have to calibrate that other bit uh, according to, well, how much risk we want to take and how much we want to learn quickly and iterate and improve based on that. And, and as you're saying, it's not just what what you want, it's what the whole community wants. And ironically, mm -hmm. you know, we're throwing things out to a DAO vote to find out what their feelings are about how it's governed. And there's, there's this odd feedback loop that you're not, um, you have to, there's obviously this decentralization ethos surrounding all this, and that has to be taken into account of which, which point you pick in that governance. Um, which is tough and you don't always know what the community wants and the community changes as you grow, which is, is a challenge. And, and, and that, that can, I don't think that cannot be stressed enough. That is not like to judge what should, like what, what the DAO should go, well, again, what's right and wrong. It really should be from the community aspect, which is this changing entity that a single individual never knows fully. Like we rely on the governance mechanism to, to learn what we want, uh, because we cannot just know it ourselves by introspection, like a traditional founder would. And and I think many DAO projects confuse that and start stressing out and being like, oh, but I, I'm not sure about that decision. And that's that's an issue. That's an attack. It's like, no, it's just different from what you you were thinking. Uh, but it might be more aligned with the community. You don't know that yet. Let it go through. And instead of trying to stomp on it uh, in the early stages, for example. Uh, anyway, Kelsey, you were saying. Yeah, lots of thoughts off the back of your comments. Uh, I guess, Darcy, you suggest that polycentricity is an approach to making a treasury more robust. Can you explain what this means and where it comes from? And then maybe identify how decisions or objectives can be set by the community within a polycentric organisation? That's a massive question, but it's great. Um, so from an academic's perspective, polycentricity is, a, a, I guess, a theoretical construct that describes a system that has many centres of decision making. And that's in contrast to a monocentric system, which has one centre of decision making. Um, a lot of the research on polycentricity um, focused on well, some of the early work by Eleanor Ostrom and Vincent Ostrom, who are economists and political scientists, um, focused on the problem of metropolitan policing, right? Now, this sounds a little bit obscure, but we'll bring it back to treasuries in a second. Um, the, the problem at the time was you had lots of different centres of little police departments, and this looked really inefficient. It looked like they were overlapping. There was no centralised administration, um, and there was a push to move all of this into one big um, monocentric system of governance, right? It looked, uh, the polycentricity looked messy and it didn't look like it was producing um, any value. And there was a lot of field work that showed that there are actually a huge amount of benefits of having lower levels of decision-making that can make their own decisions on the ground with local knowledge. They're more adaptable. Um, 
They understand their local context a lot more. Now, bringing this back to blockchains and treasuries, um, at the moment, I mean, I think this is changing, but a lot of treasuries are governed in a way that we just use one type of decision making for the treasury, right? We put everything out to a vote or we put everything to a committee or um, we just pick one type of governance structure and we go with that. Now, there's a few issues with that and I think it, it opens up a lot of attack vectors when you've got one central point of decision making. Um, the benefit of saying, okay, let's, let's make many centers of decision making. So let's have a smaller grants body that's just doing this particular type of grants. Now we have this other committee that's working on ecosystem incentives. This is another group that's elected and working on something else, right? Now, what you've got is you've got many different centers of decision-making that are all kind of specializing in their particular area. Now, this can look like bureaucracy, right? And it also looks, looks a little bit like um, centralization and hierarchy within a blockchain and communities can have issues with this, but there's value in having a more polycentric system. There's there isn't one central voting system that can be attacked, for instance, in a civil attack or, or something else. There's lots of different systems. Um, and what you get is you get a lot of discovery and learning about what those different governance structures should be. Um, some of them will fail. Some of them won't work very well. Um, we'll figure out that that committee is completely dysfunctional and disband that and so on. But I'm... I'm a big fan of polycentricity as a guiding principle. So not trying to do a one size fits all governance structure uh, and move and moving towards a more a more polycentric system. The community might not like it though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we. I. I mean, I, I. couldn't. I couldn't agree more. I, I. I was trying to to work with a few of those, of those principles for in this last big DAO project and stuff, and. And one of the one of the ideas that we've been talking a lot and and now in the ecosystem and seeing uh, again more momentum and more and more people are engaging in the conversation and the idea of of sub DAOs, which is kind of like these DAOs within a DAO. Now, the conversation also suffers from the lack of definitions around DAOs itself. So sometimes a sub DAO is a committee, sometimes a sub DAO is some community oriented voting mechanism. But but that's the whole point. Like different decision making strategies, different governance systems uh, that collaborate with with, with each other. Um, but there is indeed an, an educational problem with with the community. Uh, I, di I did encounter some some resistance of people saying like, uh, you know. Quoting from simplicity is the best answer or any sort of meme that talk about simplicity and so on. There was a subset of the community that really liked this and they were like, oh, but it's, it's very complicated and so on. And it's like, well, it's true that once you have multiple centers of decision making for anyone, anyone is going to have to try to find the ideal one for their specific use case. And if they need to learn about three or four, that's a lot more complicated than there is just one process for one. Uh, but that being said, I still see a lot of benefits on it. I guess it's it's about finding the right balance on on when to introduce it. Uh, not I, I, I maybe perhaps starting with two, so the idea is baked in since the beginning, um, and then adding more as one goes along uh, as one goes along, and really really working on the educational onboarding onboarding piece to to make sure that this is kind of like functional and people can navigate the DAO, navigate the network. Uh, but I see tremendous benefits for it. Just just even, even in the terms of cycles, if nothing else, like the length of time it takes, like if one wants to ask for a huge sum of money, that requires a lot of thinking and a lot of time. But if one needs, I don't know, $200 to pay some ETH, uh, some gas fees, well, that shouldn't take you having to write a free page proposal. Uh, but if you're asking for a million from the treasury, well, yeah, probably a free page proposal is the minimum with, you know, community feedback and rounds. Sorry, carry on right there. Well, community feedback is a very good point. Um, the question then is, so if we're starting from a, uh, I guess, a more monocentric system, there's one system of governance that we've got, how do we get to a more polycentric system? And the challenge with most polycentric systems that work is that they're not designed 
So they're, they're systems that have emerged as polycentric systems and then eventually humans come in and go, oh, this looks messy and complicated. Let's, as you say, let's simplify it. That That's all too complex. Um, the problem is that most of them started polycentric and then there's a push to centralize them. And I don't, I don't really know how we overcome that except for, as you're saying, that, that education piece. So in, there's a field in, in political economy called robust political economy. Um, and what it says is, okay, if we're trying to design a system, um, let's start from some realistic assumptions rather than some unrealistic assumptions. Let's assume that people don't know everything. So let's assume that humans are boundedly rational and they they face uncertainty and we're not sure what to do. We have a knowledge problem. Um, and let's also assume that people aren't always good people. They're not always benevolent. They will act in a self-interested way sometimes. Um, they will be opportunistic. In that circumstance, what kind of institutional system do you create to deal with those dual problems, the reality of the world. There's uncertainty and there's all these incentive problems and people can act poorly. Um, and that literature basically comes back to um, enable polycentric systems to emerge. So you have a minimum set of overarching rules. Think of it as a constitution, I guess. Um, that is designed in a way that enables centers of decision-making to emerge within it um and in this in this story what happens is that's how you get that's how you get a robust system um if if there are feedback loops as you mentioned which is a really key part of this story um then you you're you're trying to design a rule system that enables other rule systems to emerge within it um, and this is probably getting away from what Kelsey wanted, which is maybe a little bit too academic, but um, you're, you're designing for that problem of how do we evolve our governance structures when we don't know what we're doing and there's bad people. Um, and, it, and I think it, it kind of all comes back to that in the end. And that's how you get a robust system. Yeah, this is phenomenal. And the empirical research like completely backs that up in the sense of uh, there is these, you know, massive projects with huge treasuries that are having this issue of kind of re-decentralizing as Daniel said like they kind of decentralized and then sort of freaked out because that wasn't really working and then re-centralized and tried to plan again of how to give kind of governance power back to the community but this idea of working at multiple scales and you know integrating feedback loops makes complete sense and some projects are working with it so I like Examples that come to my mind uh, is the Lido Lego Grants program. That's like super, you know, light for under a certain threshold of money and, and they grant and they've got a wish list. Uh, and then another um, case study that I was really involved in is Gitcoin and looking at how they've evolved uh, some of their sort of steward working groups to become specialists in their area. But that idea you said, Darcy, about a constitution or or the kind of terms and conditions guiding the kind of norms and cultural values of a DAO, I think is really important. And I'm super curious, I guess, to hear from both of you, because you wouldn't normally think of robust treasury management as coming back to the constitutional principles of a DAO. But that seems to have sort of been the loop that we've gone in the conversation. Eugene, did you have more to add to that? I wanted to add a slightly different angle on it, just in terms of um, a lot of what has been said throughout this conversation in general touches on, uh, I feel like some, you know, challenges that might be specific to the space, some broad challenges around humans collaborating together, and then some very open-ended questions around how do humans manage ambiguity better? How do you design systems that allow for emergent behavior? And these kinds of questions that I don't think anyone has a good answer to that works in all environments yet. And right, the whole idea of you need to focus on what's right for your ecosystem. And it just makes me wonder, right, if any of you are in the position of tomorrow, you're in the situation where you now need to fully, you know, soup to nuts, figure out the treasury structure, the governance structure, and, and plan out a new kind of protocol, right? 
not to ask the moot point of give us the best practices, uh, because I think that that's a self-defeating question, but at least what would be an element of the mindset that you think is so important when thinking of these kinds of systems? Because even just as simple as, you know, if you're designing it in in the token economics and what was mentioned about what happens with the concentration of the early airdrop recipients a lot of the time, right, you inherently have to come in with this mindset of, oh, I'm building something that I don't get to control. And that seems counterintuitive, at least in certain Western cultures. So I don't know, just what are your thoughts on sort of the mindset of even thinking about these kinds of problems, given how many unknowns and points of complexity there are here? Um, Maybe I'll I'll, I'll jump in trying to tie that up uh, a bit with the the concept of the constitution as well, which I think uh, like the two can come really well together. If we're talking about trying to have a sort of foundational principles or foundational ideas that then will will take their own life and people will will make them their own and evolve them in, in some ways. Um, I would say perhaps the a few things that I that I usually like I encounter that work across multiple cases is one is thinking about the the resources or m- multiple capitals like a little bit a little bit holistically like some DAOs will have very few a very small treasury uh, but they might have a big community of engaged contributors they might have es- essentially a lot of social capital within the community a lot of knowledge capital a lot of intellectual capital uh, but limited financial capital and I think these these are largely interchangeable and way more interchangeable in the DAO world. Uh, than than before, perhaps because the market is more efficient, perhaps because there is more speculation. One can, if you have a community, you can raise a lot of funds. If you have raised a lot of funds, maybe you can just dist- do a huge airdrop and kind of like start to activate a community really quickly. Obviously, to make them a real community takes time. But anyway, it's more to say that there is this idea of not trying to to zero on the the treasury as the the only capital that one has. Uh, but thinking about that holistically and then applying these other principles to to all of them. That is the enabling self-organization at the same time that alignment mechanisms. So I think of the, I use a, a lighthouse metaphor in that the lighthouse kind of shows you where the, where the shore is. It kind of shows you where the rocks is, but the lighthouse doesn't tell you, you this is where each ship needs to go. Each ship is making their own directions but they have this sort of somewhat centralized mechanism that gives that shares information with everyone to have kind of like a shared context of where is the shore, where is the sea. And, and I think that helps a lot. And the more one can create sort of like forums, spaces, agoras where people can exchange ideas and, and negotiate their, their worldviews, like that can be having regular community gatherings. That can be, let's try to create a vision together. And the vision is non-enforceable. But just the the act of having those those bridging mechanisms kind of really really helps. While at the same time finding how to enable self organization. And I mentioned the capitals because self organization can be people can vote with their feet and they can join team A or team B or team C and they can change between those teams as they see fit. But it can also be well you can give uh, essentially the community can decide whether they fund team A or team B. And sometimes funding it is not about putting in the financial resources is just enabling people to work in one or the other. In other times, you actually need funding uh, because people can might be bootstrapping their own engagement through tokens and there will be no difference in between in between these two. But that's why I think it's, it's kind of like important to think holistically and allow some level of self-organization or essentially allow people to decide while having the broader alignment mechanisms. And then... Uh, perhaps final thing that comes to my head is related to the the complexity of the of the constitution is there is uh, there can be a lot of tension in between trying to create uh, a constitution that is very com- comprehensive and and protects a lot from from different situations and and then on trying to be very well ad- uh, to adhere very well to the constitution instead of taking it more as a as a loose general sense making, as a lighthouse, essentially. One can try to take it more as the absolute rules. And I think the more the constitution can come close to a lighthouse, obviously one needs clear rules, but the more the, let's say the human readable uh, part of it can be a lighthouse, 
and the and the ingrained mechanism design that is hard coded in the blockchain and has no ambiguity the more like the hard rules we can shift them to the blockchain so let the blockchain do what it does really well code is not ambiguous let code be unambiguous and when we can allow ambiguity let's that as much human readable uh, as possible so because otherwise we can try like uh with I don't know, we, uh, there can be a lot of issues of like, but that's not what that interpretation should mean. And before we realize, suddenly we end up with all the legal complexity that a lot of people are trying to escape away and then you have loads of lawyers involved. And these, these can quickly snowball into a disaster and becomes a cultural thing where every decision needs to be checked with the lawyers before anything happens. And, and then you lose all agility and, and your feedback loops become super long. I, I find it very, very interesting and I agree. Um, I think the the problem is who decides where the lighthouse is. So in in the very early stages of um a an ecosystem, there there's a reason why constitutions and even a description of what a treasury is for is just incredibly broad, right? It's just gonna solve all the problems, it's gonna fix everything in web three. Um there's like this broad idea of what a a treasury does. Um, and I think that's for good reason. There's lots of uncertainty, but then we need some way to um, hone in on more specific problems as they arise. So right now we might be facing a massive scaling problem, right? The constitution or whatever we initially said the treasury was for, we didn't know that this was going to be our problem this six months. So the question is then how do you create a system where um that second objective can emerge as an objective. Now, this, this sounds a little bit circular, but what this looks like to me is the perhaps the community deciding, setting some sort of new objective for a, for a bucket of treasury funds saying, we're just focusing on scaling. And then what I would like to see is delegation of those funds to people with some discretionary use of them. So maybe the community acts as a kind of... A, I guess a, a sovereign, if you will, that decides here's our objective for this this round. But then what you do is once the community is set on a, an objective, then um, with that money, you delegate it to people who can do whatever they want with it to try and achieve the objective. Um, I don't know what they want to do with it. They might convert it straight to USDC and everyone gets really angry. And then um, there's there's a bunch of different paths that they can go. But if you have a feedback loop at the end and those effectively entrepreneurs that have been delegated to um, can try and achieve the objective, then you, you do bring it back to the community at the end. Um, but I think you're exactly right that uh, the lighthouse kind of needs to set these boundaries and then people need to have some freedom within them. Um, it's just that that changes over time and it's not going to just sit in an initial constitution or an initial description of what a treasury should do. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very hard problem. I just wish there was, um, more, um, we treated this more like an entrepreneurial problem that we're handing out cash to someone to just try and solve it, solve the problem quickly. And then we have feedback at the end, um, rather than everything being decided by everyone. <laughs> Yeah, that's so interesting. And what you've kind of described is sort of what Gitcoin looks like, but as a funding mechanism in the Ethereum community that has gone through multiple iterations from the DAO, which was meant to be, you know, pure algorithmic governance and obviously suffered from a, a bug in the software code to Ethereum Foundation Grants Program to Ethereum Community Fund. And there's been all these kind of fails, but lessons learned along the way and then Gitcoin has kind of iterated and now transitioned to a DAO where you're you are seeing all of these buckets for mon of money changing each round for all these different things you know getting sort of um, donated to all these different teams so that's actually quite interesting I guess we're seeing a new evolution of that that I think can can really help these um, this approach uh, that you're mentioning that that is the that we have escrow mechanisms that are starting to come into effect. There are KPI options, so essentially the 
anyway, di different mechanisms designs. There is even the the courts that can uh, like Claro, Celeste, Aragon Court, and so on that can see like if plugged in into one of these projects where that funds or initiatives uh, or a person or a small team that that has gotten some funds delegated to them to try to solve a problem. Uh, these different mechanisms can help to to mitigate the, the risk here. And so I'm hoping that we see more and more of this approach because historically there has been also the situations where someone asks for a grant and then they keep the money and disappear because they were anonymous and no one knows who they are anyway. Or, or maybe they're not even anonymous, but they just don't deliver at all and keep the money. And and so with, with some mechanisms, I see both uh, a fantastic opportunity to have more of these, also perhaps the risk that people become end up designing for the only for the situations where it has gone wrong instead for the many situations where where it went right uh, but and and I, I see a little bit that risk with escrow systems you know it's like oh no there was one time someone ran away with funds so now let me make sure that everything is super regulated and so on but if used properly these mechanisms can add a lot of safety for for contracting and so on and and really enable the delegation of funds and perhaps more autonomy while the, the objective at the end or, or even the objective initially is kept clear, as long as this is kind of really kept at the, let's say, at the edges in small experiments, quick feedback loops, because otherwise we end up a little bit in the, in the waterfall approach of like, let's do loads of planning for a project that's going to last a year. Uh, and, have, and halfway through that project, we discovered that it was a terrible idea and the objective should have been completely different and there is no room to to iterate on this. Uh, so it's more like trying to leave the iteration very open, objectives that can evolve very quickly, but then having the quick feedback loops to review all of that, to give some funding, experiment with a phase, see what happens, allow people to, to figure out their own strategies, their own way to, to invest these funds. Uh, and then obviously across a portfolio of initiatives that are being invested in, if one of them turns sour, if one of them turns malicious, then you eliminate them and don't give them the next tranche of funding uh, and, and continue betting on the others and, and taking more like a, a sort of risk investment approach, like a VC approach almost to treasury management rather than, than a very tightly controlled, uh, centrally planned, like loads of <laughs> pre-thinking, loads of long project, like no, not mega project management, but more like VC approach to, to treasury management, I would say. I, I completely agree with that approach. Um, and I think it goes back to something that I mentioned earlier, which is we should try and learn from the real world as much as we can in this space. We've had, we've seen grants giving bodies and VCs for hundreds of years now, right? Um, VCs are obviously solving a particular entrepreneurial problem that um, you have uncertainty whether, about the, whether they're going to do the thing or not. Um, governments have this problem where they have, all of this money and they need to fund innovation and they've tried to solve that in many ways. Sometimes they use prizes, sometimes they use grants. Um, they they have a whole suite of tools that they deploy to try and deal with this, this fundamental problem that um, none of us really know what we're doing, but we need some, some, we need to hand out this money to get some sort of innovation or research or some good that we want. Um, but we should design in feedback mechanisms after the fact. Um, and I, I think you, you are exactly right. Yeah, I really like that. And you guys mentioned before um, just the point of experimenting with different types of mechanisms. So it's not a vote, everyone votes, so it's 100% pass, you know, next question put to the entire, you know, community of hundreds of people, even if it's a specific, you know, topic area thing. So I can see that uh, polycentric approach sort of starting to apply. Do either of you have any opinions on algorithms and their role in governance in, in DAOs or treasury management as well? You, you, Daniel, you just referred to kind of decentralized court mechanisms. And I've been keenly interested in this idea of, you know, who gets to design the algorithms and when are they an opportunity to remove, uh, I guess an option for political coercion or, you know, centralization and control, or when are they a potential threat in the sense that you, you can so effectively manage and monitor an online community that people kind of have potentially strayed from the initial ideology or goals? I find the, the court's mechanisms to be really, really interesting 
the, the they're based uh, at least the the three that I know of that I was mentioning Aragon Court, Celeste, and Claros were were very 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 similar. They they all start with the shilling game idea, which is a relatively simple algorithm. The idea is is basically people are incentivized to give their opinion, and if they agree, if like essentially, if all three people are agreeing, then that's good. They all get rewarded. If one of them disagrees, then they get penalized. And and so what these forces is that instead of people saying this is what I think is best or this is what I think is right they try to figure out what is the default interpretation. What are my peers most likely to understand and think in this situation? So, so it's this very, very peculiar mechanism that allows to find like a sort of what, what, what is the most likely consensus in a subjective situation. And, and so they're a way to, to kind of bring the, the human readable world, the, the ambiguous world, uh, into into more objective terms and play with that, and so they compare well with like constitutions or with some sort of like human readable agreements to say to then interpret did the agreement actually m- meant that this decision is within the agreement or outside of the agreement and is trying to depart. Now that as a theory works really well in practice is really really challenging and these mechanisms are still quite brute quite quite early stages i i found personally in like through through direct experience this is not research based or anything like that but just my own observation is that they work mostly as a psychological deterrent to attacks like if any attacker goes like well there is a court and i have to put some collateral to put this proposal forward and the community might challenge it in court. So maybe let me not, uh, like there is no point in me trying to just do, a, I don't know, a, a flash loan and try to get the, the, the community to transfer all the funds to me because there is a court mechanism and they can stop it. So in practice, they get used very, very little, very, very infrequently, uh, but they, they add kind of like the safety mechanism. When they do actually come into effect and they actually need to do their work, it's a little bit messy and it, it's a bit expensive and you probably require multiple rounds and to end up bringing a lot of juries, jurors together and so on to actually found this default interpretation. And, and then the jurors might be even very confused and so on, uh, which I think is more to say that they are at a very early stage of development uh, as tools, but they kind of protect against these, let's say the, the 51% attacks and, and stuff like that. And, and so now coming back to the point on, on algorithms to this, I think this is a relatively simple algorithm is the majority gets rewarded, the minority get, gets penalized. And of the, of the arbiters, of the guardians, of the jurors in the court, right? So the, these sort of relatively simple, me- simple algorithms that are smartly used can add tremendous value in in governance decisions. And and I do envisage envisage a future where we can have more complex algorithms like AI, ML sort sort of things, neural networks coming in and helping with decision making and supporting decision making is an area that is still to a very large degree unexplored. Probably where we will see it emerging the most will be in DeFi space. Uh, because a lot of the decisions are relatively simple, like you have at least you have clear criteria of what a good outcome is. We want number to go up. If there is, if the treasure is worth more in a month from now than it is worth now, that's a good thing. Okay, cool. That's clear. We can probably set a, ma- a machine, an algorithm to try to optimize for that without being too worried about what would happen. Uh, but then if we set up, uh, try to delegate to an algorithm to optimize for this community wants uh, to be better and that no one knows what that means and every person has a different idea of what that means, then it's really, really hard to plug these, these algorithms. Uh, and then we probably need a lot simpler algorithms that can be more a support mechanism rather than, than doing the, the heavy lifting of decision making. Uh, just because the question is so complex and they, we can end up with a lot of sub-optimization that has unintended consequences. Just to add to that, it's, um, it's, it's super early and we've kind of got innovation and experimentation happening at, at multiple levels. So there's this kind of, 
I mean, classic distinction, classic is very early in blockchain terms, but um, between the governance of blockchains and the governance by blockchains. So when we're talking about the governance of blockchains, we're talking about everything we've had in this conversation. How do we decide what to do with the treasury or upgrade or whatever it is? That's the governance of blockchains, which is a hard problem. But at the same time, we've got governance by blockchains. So blockchains are powering up all these other technologies like Daniel mentioned um, to enable automatic execution of the outputs of other algorithms, for instance. Now, in my mind, these are sort of, sometimes we conflate the two things and it can make it really, really complex. We're trying to solve multiple problems at the same time. Um, I am super bullish on the opportunity for these um, algorithms as an input into governance decision-making. Um, I just worry sometimes it's a little bit early and it's, it's very experimental. Um, so for instance, in treasury management, if you're talking about something like treasury um, diversification, um, it might be useful for you to have a committee making decisions about treasury diversification, but maybe they are informed by some kind of prediction market about how the treasury should be um, diversified, that it's an input into their decision um, but not necessarily throwing it all over to that um, straight away. But I, there's super exciting stuff going on in this space. And I think, um, as Daniel's mentioned a few times throughout this podcast, there's just so much work going into tooling. And I am very excited to see where we are in six months or a year's time. Um, six months ago, if you were trying to spin up a DAO, you were kind of doing everything from you know, from scratch in a way. I feel like if you're spinning up a DAO in a year's time, it'll be obvious that you need to do this and this and this, and you use this tool for that. And um, you'll still stuff it up, but you'll have a much better idea of um, what are all those parts that need to come together, in including algorithms. And unfortunately, our time together is coming to an end for the day, but I, I appreciate all of the different ideas brought up and especially this point of experimentation and how much change is happening. Uh, that feels like a really appropriate note to be ending on given in general how fast things move in any tech and startup space, but especially in crypto, you know, what, what is a day in a normal space uh, moves in very different time here with just the amount of innovations and pockets of activity and innovation. So I know I'm really excited to likewise learn from all these different projects and figure out how to best share and converse about them. But I just wanted to give uh, everyone a chance to sort of plug any final thoughts or things that you're just most uh, kind of keen on uh, and keeping an eye on as we kind of wrap this year and, and head into the new year? I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I, think, I, I think you're exactly right to focus on experimentation. And I think um, when we're talking about treasuries and we're talking about treasury attacks and all of these problems, we can get a little bit too focused on um, all of the threats to a treasury and not focus on the long-term, how can we experiment with some tools and some things will go wrong. Um, so that we can figure out how to best do this. And I think, as I've mentioned, that happens in a, in a polycentric way. Um, and that has to be built in from an early stage, this idea that we are developing this DAO or this treasury with the idea that part of our mission is experimenting with our own governance structures, um, because I think it's harder to try and put that in after the fact. Um, but I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation um, and super exciting to hear all the work that, that Daniel's doing as well. Likewise, um, very important points. I, in my language, I frame it as the think about the DAO as a platform and like a basic platform where things are built on top and emerge on top. And we're really in the era of this platform, like the blockchain is a platform, the DAO, a platform built on top of the blockchain. And then we have other platforms and other applications built on top and, and the teams themselves are platforms and so on and, and really embracing this mindset. And perhaps one, one single thing that I, I feel we didn't touch upon that I, I would like to just put into the conversation, even at, at the 11th hour that that is the, the importance of the individual mindset and, and kind of personal development in, as we go through this. I think one of the most challenging things around being able to manage a, a treasury effectively and more generally DAOs and blockchains 
is is the fact that decentralization means that we don't have a lot of control and some, sometimes things don't go the way we initially intended. Uh, and we need to have uh, kind of like a, a really strong grounding ourselves like psychologically to feel this is okay. It's an experiment. Uh, let it happen. Let other people chip into the conversation. Let the answer be a little bit more ambiguous than than the perfect clear vision that I had at the beginning. And, and I've been a victim of this, especially when when uh, I've been recently under a lot of pressure to deliver things. It, it's really easy to forget that, no, wait, my idea is not the final one. We're, we're in this together. And and if we can do that, if we can try to keep that grounding and, and be kind to each other, it's a lot easier to experiment and a lot easier to, to not obsess over the one failure compared to the nine right that you got uh, and rather move to the next cycle of experimentation and uh, and invite people to participate when if we can come from that place. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Darcy and Daniel. It's been a really good learning experience just um, conversing with you. I think some of the points that surfaced for me was uh, really that point about polycentricity, and I'd love to see more examples of that being applied and kind of learnings uh, from those experiments. Um, and Daniel, you mentioned a number of times about kind of human readable systems so whether that's the contracts or the constitutions um, to keep them human readable and I think that in the context of governance of and by algorithms is a fascinating whole nother episode but thank you to to Skurf for the the opportunity to to be here yeah thank you thank Kelsey you thank you Daniel thank you Darcy yeah, we Thank really appreciate much. everyone taking the time. I also, yeah, Daniel, you especially ending with the personal development and psychology of decentralizations could not have ended on a stronger tease for me conversationally. But uh, yeah, we'll have to save <laughs> that for another time. And uh, we'll have to do a whole mini series on the psychology of how to decentralize in the first place. Uh, but yeah, again, I do just want to thank everyone for taking their time to tune into the interview and tremendously appreciative of our guests, Daniel Darcy and Kelsey, for all taking the time to join us. Uh, this episode was part of our mini series on building a treasury and funding public goods uh, that we're producing in conjunction with our RMIT. So please feel free to reach out to uh, us on Twitter or over on smartcontractresearch.org if you want to be part of the conversation. And thanks again and be well, everyone.